it's 5 p.m. on the dot. Um, others will start uh, joining us, but since we have so little time, uh, we thought we would start us off. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to our online discussion, uh, Wartime Disinformation Landscape and CE, which is part of our Hive Mind Series Resiliency Kit. Uh, my name is Maya Duri. I work for TechSoup Europe uh, from our Warsaw office, uh, where it is, like I mentioned, currently about 100 degrees. And I will serve as uh, your moderator for today. And together with the text uh, team and Hivemind team, when we had an idea for organizing this series uh, as an sort of online check-in type of uh, thing, something that would help equip activists uh, and CSOs with skills, knowledge, and inspiration necessary to navigate the post-COVID uh, uh, reality uh, when it came to topics like social media, uh, countering disinformation, digital safety and security, um, but then obviously the 24th of February happened, Russia invaded Ukraine and situation changed uh, dramatically. And ever since we've made uh, the war, its aftermath uh, and ways of supporting the uh, brave Ukrainians um, our main focus. So at this point, um, it's been almost four months. Uh, this uh, war is still very much going on, um, but a sense of, um, I don't know if stabilization is the right word, um, but it has started to settle in uh, for better or for worse. And as we move towards a sort of more long-term conflict, new challenges uh, start to come uh, more into play. And one of them being uh, obviously uh, um, with more over um, 6 million uh, refugees fleeing from Ukraine and the whole world struggling uh, with the economic crisis. Uh, we have to expect uh, intensified efforts from Russia to weaken the sense of solidarity with Ukraine to fuel divisions, uh, to stir up anti-Ukrainian uh, sentiments. And uh, apart from obviously uh, ongoing support of various kinds, uh, there are also things that we can do on a daily basis, us as individuals, our loved ones, our, our organizations, that hopefully will contribute to the fight against uh, Putin's propaganda machine. And uh, that thing is, that we can do is we need to be more aware and capable to spot and I ideally counter disinformation coming at us from various channels. And luckily uh, today we have our great experts uh, to help us with that, to help us uh, strengthen our resiliency um, through taking us through an update of, uh, of what the disinformation landscape looks like uh, right now in their countries. Um, but also uh, part of our conversation will be dedicated to what can we do about it. Um, and we purposefully invited um, the, our wonderful experts from different countries uh, in order to get a better and sort of a more comprehensive um, overview of um, of what the um, of what the situation uh, looks like. Uh, so today we have with us from Slovakia, uh, Tomasz Kryszak. Uh, Tomasz is an expert uh, on cognitive security, currently working for Gerulata Technologies as an analyst. Uh, but over the years, Tomasz has worked uh, or been a part of many uh, Slovak initiatives and projects that tackle phenom modern phenomena of disinformation and hate speech, unfortunately also himself being a target of it. Um, uh, we have Irina Švets uh, uh, from Ukraine. Uh, Irina is currently the director of um, Opora Lviv. Uh, Irina is an activist and a project manager with more than 10 years of experience in the field of civic engagement. Um, and Opora is mostly known uh, as a watchdog uh, network for Ukraine's election process, but since the escalation of the war um, has moved their efforts towards documenting and reporting uh, Russian war crimes. Um, and maybe Anna will talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we have from Georgia, uh, Jana Sibiladze, a project coordinator at, coordinator at the Georgian Information Integrity Program uh, implemented by the Zinc Network. And uh, Jana is also um, a teacher, uh, teaches, teaches disinformation, propaganda, uh, information warfare courses at Tbilisi State University. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, from Romania, we have Ciprian Koko. Uh, Ciprian is an expert in countering disinformation and media literacy, co-founder and vice president of Forum Apurum, um, NGO that works in civic engagement, civic education, and fostering critical thinking skills. Chibian has a PhD in educational technologies as it, and is also a lecturer at the University of Alba Iulia. So a lot of teachers were among us today. 
Um, and we would love for this to be a conversation. Uh, obviously, uh, you as participants have your microphones off, but we very warmly invite you to um, uh, take part by asking questions through the chat that we will be monitoring throughout uh, um, the panel, and uh, we will um, focus on them in the last part of our uh, meeting during the Q&A session. And um, uh, just to, uh, for those who couldn't join us or would like to rewatch it, uh, we are recording our session, we are streaming it live through our social media channels and um, the recording, uh, as well as links or to resources that our experts mentioned today uh, will, will be sent to you uh, via email uh, tomorrow uh, in the afternoon. So without further ado, uh, I will stop and uh, I will give the uh, uh, voice to uh, Tomasz who will start us off uh, with an analysis of the current landscape of this information. Tomasz, over to you. Thank you, Maya, and hello, everyone. I'm so glad I can be uh, sharing my findings with you today. And uh, as we were discussing, uh, well, we will be looking at themes and topics that were dominating in our information sphere not only in Slovakia, but also in Czechia and Poland. Uh, the data I will be showing you were uh, uh, collected uh, by our platform in Garota Technologies. And well, the first uh, country that I will be giving you an overview, like uh, what was going on in there and how information, uh, disinformation were affecting the minds of Poles. Uh, well, you can see that uh, when the invasion happened, uh, there was a huge uh, spike of content and interactions that were created regarding the topic. But as uh, time went on, the interest in the topic has been uh, getting weaker and weaker. But uh, the good the good news are that uh, Poland has become or uh, was and still is when we are seeing the information space, I would say one of the most healthiest uh, information spaces in Europe. And the majority of uh, the content regarding Ukraine was very positive. It was positive uh, for Ukrainians, um, uh, improving the ability to, uh, well, uh, act in solidarity with Ukrainians and support it. So uh, there was also some negative content. Uh, I have found it uh, mostly from this source called Ruch Narodowy. And here, for instance, you can see on this post from May, a very interesting, I would say, conspirational theory that actually says that uh, the support uh, to Ukraine and the whole situation in Ukraine is actually some kind of uh, uh, evil uh, plan of some elites to actually uh, have this uh, digital uh, tyranny, I would say, something of that kind. So, so, so this was uh, one of the prevalent disinformation narratives that I have found in Poland. Also, there were attempts to decrease uh, the solidarity of Poles towards Ukraine. And here uh, we have a post that was actually inspired by, um, well, a survey that happened in, in, in Poland. And it was of uh, quite manipulative nature. Then when we are looking at Slovakia, we see almost the same situation when it comes to the peak of content and interactions uh, at 24th of uh, February. And as you can see, uh, the, um, well, the number of content is uh, steadily falling down as well as interactions, but the situation in Slovakia is far more different and I would say radically different from Poland. And unfortunately, the dominance of disinformation and very negative and critical narratives towards Ukraine are dominant and they have most of the interactions. And also they don't really come from fringe actors, but from very uh, powerful people, politicians, and people who have like huge support. So that's very different from other countries in Central and Eastern Europe. For instance, here you can see a video where a, a local politician is very critical towards Mr. Zelensky. And whenever Mr. Zelensky was having like uh, his critical speeches regarding uh, the lack of support of Ukraine and et cetera, he actually used it to create a picture of how unthankful uh, Ukraine is. So, uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of people were actually mm, reacting to that kind of content. Uh, again, another politician was uh, and is still continuously creating something I call uh, strategic communication here. And uh, it is also having like a very negative connotation. And I would say it's also a part of uh, conspirational theory that creates a false uh, 
theory that this war is actually between US and Russia and Ukraine is only a proxy that has been dragged into the war and other countries, including Slovakia, are falsely dragged as well by the US. So uh, this has been uh, happening as a narrative here for a longer period of time and they don't seem to have uh, any plans to change that rhetoric. And lastly, I will show you Czech Republic and you can see that uh, the spike uh, of content there was the highest as well as the interactions. And again, uh, as similar to Poland, most of the content was very positive towards Ukraine. This, uh, the wave of solidarity is still present. Uh, but as you can see, uh, even though there was a lot of content even in the past few weeks, the interactions around that content were steadily decreasing, which is also showing us that people are um, tired of the news of Ukraine and they are really trying to focus on other things, other uh, topics. But when it comes to negative and critical uh, communication and narratives, the ones that were emerging in Czech Republic were led uh, by one particular politician, Mr. Okamura. And he, he was like one of the few actually actors who were very negative regarding Ukraine. And in this case, for instance, he used uh, one uh, radio report uh, where he added this picture uh, of uh, um, uh, of tra uh, tra tra travelers, of refugees uh, from, from Prague, but actually this was not really uh, included in the original report. And he was trying to create this false, um, um, well, false expectation that most of the refugees uh, that are actually coming to Czech Republic are not really Ukrainian women and children, but uh, uh, it, they are people from African countries or uh, Middle East countries. And the same narratives were actually used uh, in Slovakia in early March. And uh, they were basically tr trying to trigger the same amount of negative emotions as they did during the uh, refugee crisis in 2015. Uh, the truth is that uh, out of the 6 million refugees that fled Ukraine, uh, 200,000 uh, were, for instance, in Slovakia, and only around 500 uh, uh, students, actually students from Africa, India, and other countries were traveling here so they could then catch a plane and go to their home countries. So it wasn't really uh, uh, the refugee crisis that Mr. Wakamura and others were trying to depict. So. Uh, here I would then end my presentation and give space to my other colleagues and if you have any questions I will be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Tomasz, thank you so much. Um, if I could maybe pass it on to uh, Jana uh, first to, to tell, to reflect on what the situation looks like in Georgia. Is it similar? Are you seeing similar trends? Um, what is happening in, in Georgia, which is obviously also uh, a very in a very delicate position in a, in a long term conflict with uh, Russia? Russia. Thank you so much, Maya. So whatever uh, Thomas has mentioned um, from his experience from Slovakia and Czechia is very much relevant and applicable to Georgia. So Georgia has been a tar target of the Russian information warfare since I would say 2008, since the war happened in Georgia. So since then they were testing what campaign or what tactic worked in Georgia, and then they were spreading this and applying this to other countries as well. So since the war started in Ukraine in February, the volume of the disinformation coming from Russia just increased. So in general, Georgia, in Georgia, information ecosystem is not very healthy. It's very much manipulated by Russia and Russia sponsored um, actors. Um, so um, since the war started, uh, the, the, the messages and the narratives directed um, were directed to Ukraine, to the West, and to the Russian people itself. So these narratives are either anti-Western, anti-Ukraine, or Ukrainian people, and pro-Russian. So probably I'll talk about um, anti-Ukraine narratives first. Um, so first of all, you, uh, Russia, Russian narratives, and they are spread both in Georgian and Russian as well. And sometimes in Armenian and Azerbaijani languages, because as you know, we have ethnic minorities and Russia is kind of uh, spreading information in every channel, in every languages to reach as many people as possible. So um, 
the first claim was that um, uh, Russia, I mean, Ukraine is manipulating numbers of casualties. They are manipulating uh, even stories. Probably you remember this Mariupol blogger that uh, she made a uh, story of her pregnancy and that was a false pregnancy. Um, then uh, they were claiming that Bucha massacre has never happened. And if it happened, that was caused by, and they were killed, these people were killed uh, by Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians themselves. Um, they were targeting Azovi battalion. Uh, that they are Nazis, uh, they are still targeting that they are Nazis and they are killing people and they are targeting and bombing uh, residential areas. Of course, Zelensky was also, President Zelensky was targeted. Um, and at the very beginning initial stage of the war, uh, Russian narratives were claiming that uh, Zelensky had fled the country, but after he has shown up and he said that I'm, I'm, still, I'm staying in Kiev and here are my colleagues uh, from my cabinet, uh, then Russia started to play on, um, on other sentiments like Zelensky is drug addicted, he's Nazi, he's making jokes of Georgians. Uh, you know, he was a comedian, right? And when he was a comedian, he made some jokes about Georgia. And then pro-Russian uh, groups in Georgia started showing this comedy episodes to Georgians and saying, see, um, um, Zelensky is humiliating our traditions. He's not respecting us, so he's, he's against, against Georgia. So things like that really happened. Um, uh, then um, um, uh, there were some videos showing that Ukrainians were burning their churches, and this is a big issue for Georgians because we are also Orthodox and Ukrainians are Orthodox, and Georgians were like, oh my God, this is really happening in Ukraine. I mean, these people, like the Zelensky government, what they are doing, they are, they are burning their, their, their churches. Um, yeah, I mean, um, and there were some manipulative videos about uh, Ukrainian refugees that they are not behaving uh, properly and their behaviors are not, uh, you know, like uh, acceptable. And as for the West, um, this has been a big issue. Um, I mean, US funded laboratories in Ukraine and Georgia, uh, even during the pandemic. So when pandemic erupted and happened in Georgia, uh, Russian uh, disinformation sources were claiming that that was coming out of uh, Lugar Laboratory, which was funded by, uh, by, by the US and that Georgian and Ukrainian governments are testing some biological weapons in these laboratories, et cetera, et cetera. Some people really believe that, trust me. And then um, some sources were claiming that sanctions do not work. And if they work, they damage Europe and the West more than, uh, than Russia itself because the European market is very much dependent on, on Russia. Um, and Again, um, that was the US and the West, uh, which started the war against, uh, against Russia. Uh, and then a uh, big thing is uh, here for Georgia is that um, even the government, and this is really said, is claiming that uh, the West and the European Union are trying to drag Georgia into the war and open the second front. And uh, we were talking about this candidacy status, and I'm really happy that Moldova and Ukraine has, have got it and Georgia did not, we only got this uh, European perspective. And now uh, our government is selling this issue uh, through the fact that we were punished for not opening a second front in Georgia. And that's why we did not get, we did not get this uh, candidacy status. I mean, if there was a war in Georgia, then um, we would be with this uh, trio with Moldova and Ukraine. Yeah, this is also really sad. Um, and uh, as for, uh, there is something uh, very popular here, Georgia, uh, regarding Poland, that Poland is trying to regain its historical territories and uh, seize uh, the Western Ukraine. Um, maybe you all know about Jirinovsky's um, some crazy idea and the map that the Ukraine is trying to, you know, seize uh, the Western, uh, Western Ukraine. I mean, Poland is trying to see the Western Ukraine and um, those, uh, this map was spread uh, in Georgia as well. And people really talked that probably this is a war between uh, Poland and uh, Russia and they are just trying to divide, uh, divide Ukraine. Um, and when it comes to justifying actions, um, uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine, um, Russia and pro-Russian uh, pro actors are saying that it was a preventive war because uh, Nazi Zelensky and uh, Nazi people we are trying to kill, uh, you know, like innocent people from uh, republics of uh, so-called republics of uh, Luhansk and uh, Donetsk. And uh, that's why they had to start the war. They did not want to start the war, but they started this war just to, you know, like help these people. And uh, that Russia is not targeting civilians and they are not bombing uh, residential areas. And that's Ukraine, uh, which kind of endangers people like innocent civilians. 
And then, uh, you know, there was a big myth in Georgia that uh, Russia is a um, second, uh, the most powerful power in terms of the military in the world. And some people really believe that, you know, Russia, Russia is really powerful. And uh, still Russia is claiming that they are advancing in Ukraine and they are taking some of the territories and they are taking some of the cities like Mariupol and they have some big victories there. You know, some people are buying that, some people really believe that, but we don't know what's happening in, in, in fact. Yeah, I mean, um, and now uh, after this uh, news from from European Union that we are not getting um, a candidacy status, now big volume towards uh, West, the West and the European Union of this information is just coming. And uh, as I've mentioned, as I've said, um, such kind of news and narratives and messages, false information is not sometimes, but mostly sponsored and spread by the ruling party. And uh, this is really sad because, um, you know, like um, they have, they, they, they still have support, at least like 75% or something. And um, they have uh, the biggest media in Georgia, for example, TV, TV Medi, and this is the most popular TV in Georgia. And when T TV Medi says to Georgians that, you know, we did not, we were punished, we did not get this TV, uh, European candidacy because we did not open a second front here, then um, some people really believe that. And now uh, us, I mean, we uh, civil society have to really, a fight against this information and it's, it's a really big struggle for us to show people that no European Union is, is a um, you know like a peaceful organization and they are not trying to drag us into the war and the West uh, is not uh, trying out uh, trying to drag us into the war as well so yeah this is the information ecosystem here um, yeah I don't have uh, very any positive remarks and any any hopes that it will change in, in um, probably a couple of months but uh, we will see we are observing what's happening so thank you thank you thank you Susanna. that was very comprehensive so from what you're saying it's it's all encompassing meaning the disinformation in regards to it, it's on the layer of being anti-ukrainian meaning the society anti-refugee uh, anti-government anti-US, uh, um, anti-Poland, uh, meaning like uh, um, on a political level, on a diplomatic level, on a societal level. So it sort of seems all encompassing. Um, so I would maybe turn it to Ciprian to uh, to share your thoughts. Uh, is it as bad in Romania? Well, not as bad as Georgia. <laughs> uh, we are in the European Union for some time. Um, Romania is... Um, well, let's say average uh, pro-European, pro-Western, um, well, close to Poland, I would say, maybe not as much as Poland, but in, in some regards uh, we, can, we can match Poland, but in others maybe not. Um, information ecosystem is not as well established, unfortunately, in Romania. Um, but Romania is also pretty anti-Russian. Uh, like Poland, so uh, there are people who are not necessarily pro-Western, but they still are a little bit anti-Russian, so that's um, influencing the information sphere, so um, it's been dominated by pro-Ukrainian pro uh, messages, um, the government has been consistent, um, there are some exceptions, of course, um, uh, for instance, uh, there's an interesting thing that I've discovered, Russian propaganda, so direct Russian propaganda, uh, since uh, Sputnik is uh, no longer accessible, um, it uh, kind of moved to Telegram, especially in uh, Romania. So we have um, a couple of uh, Telegram channels that, you know, literally get uh, messages from the Russian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs or for the, from the Russian Ministry of Defense. So they get them straight from Russia, from Russian sources. They promote a lot of um, such um, theories. We, we know them. They are pretty much the same, that Ukraine is uh, not an actual country, uh, that you know they have been part of Russia, that uh, Ukraine are uh, Nazis that uh, just do the bidding of uh, US and uh, the European Union. Uh, so, so, so things like that we, we are seeing on, on this uh, telegram that um, uh, 
promotes the Russian talking points along with a lot of uh, Russian self-promoting that uh, they are uh, winning, especially in the more recent period of time, because at the beginning they were a little bit um, confused about what was going on. They didn't expect uh, it to go so badly. Uh, but now they are kind of uh, pushing these narratives that look, we're, we're winning, we're winning, but we're also nice, we're treating prisoners nice. So these are the, the Russian propaganda direct messages that have been coming here. Um, we do have a, a couple of um, populist right wing politicians. There's this new party that uh, went into parliament at the last elections and it's a right wing populist party. No one expected it, but it's just got enough votes to get into parliament. Um, they have a few, they, even for them, these positions are, are outliers, but they are a few people there who kind of um, promote this um, um, messaging that, um, you know, Russia is not that bad, uh, NATO and the European Union tell us too much what to do, you know, the, the sort of, um, we are a colony of the West uh, narrative that I'm sure it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty obvious everywhere. So um, there was one interesting case about uh, one of the leaders of the Orthodox uh, Church in Romania who praised Putin because he's building churches. So this was um, actually kind of at the beginning of the conflict, but this is a very special character also because he had some kind of conflict with the uh, uh, leadership of the Romanian Orthodox. So she's, he's, he's part of it. I mean, it's a very complex structure, but he's part of it, but he doesn't see eye to eye with the other people in the leadership. He's trying to kind of get his own thing going, uh, I guess. Um, so um, this is the, the direct propaganda. Other, other than that, there's this, um, um, well, they are, they are a minority of uh, people who promote this sort of anti-Western um, anti-US propaganda. There's a lot of that going on, especially on Telegram, but also on Facebook. We don't use a lot of Twitter in Romania. So um, there's a lot of uh, messaging pointing out that, you know, US did that and US did this, pointing out to the war in former Yugoslavia where NATO interfered and, and all kinds of false analogies and um, uh, what about isms, right? So there's a, there's a lot of that um, going on. Um, also, um, I was really, it was really interesting to see what Tomas said about the conspiracy theories. And we have those a lot. That, that, that's a very interesting phenomenon, I think, because some people that started to have a following during the pandemic just kind of shifted the topics a little bit, but they, they, they connect them together now. So for these people, um, war is, you know, just a part of one plan that includes, uh, you know, diseases, uh, that includes uh, like they how to, they like to call them experimental drugs like the vaccine um, that includes even um, even uh, sexual revolutions so that's also interesting that's also included in this whole plan to um, um, control the population or depopulate the planet it's not very clear which one but one of these is the the end game. So this is the, the larger narrative, but of course there are some 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 smaller, more specific narratives like um, people claiming that, well, you know, American military industrial complex needs money. So, well, there's a war. <laughs> so there's also this kind of um, you know, matching uh, points uh, together on this uh, canvas. Um, so, um, of course, this is, you know, this is generic. Every every time you hear about 
uh, the World Economic Forum. Everybody, every time something happens on 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 a global scale, um, there's gonna be this line of anti-globalist activists who sometimes mix in conspiracy theories, or well, most of the time it's in conspiracy theories, and they're gonna attack this. Um, whatever happens so that's not um, um it doesn't matter if it's a war or something else um Trivia, i'm so sorry can i can i interrupt because i'm so sorry because yes, sure. <laughs> uh, i'm i'm a, a little bit worried uh, uh about time and yes. we will continue this conversation uh but could i uh could i turn it over to irina because i think what we were talking about Trivian, um uh, Tomasz uh, and Jana uh, is obviously an outsider's perspective, right? So we are the countries uh, outside of Ukraine and we are um, targeted by a different type of content and different type of disinformation than Ukraine itself. And Irina, I think, gets a little bit of both, meaning uh, functioning both in the international infosphere uh, as well as in the Ukrainian one. And I know that could be a separate whole, separate topic of a, of a different discussion. How does disinformation look like in Ukraine? But Irina, maybe your, your thoughts and observations when it comes to what is happening. Are there big differences between what is happening in Ukraine and what you're seeing is coming out, out outside of the country? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think, you know, that um, it's not so much big difference, but it is a difference within the Ukraine as well on what we have seen before the war and what we observe right now. And I think the situation before the war, it has very much to do with the Georgian case, as Jana explained, um, because and also, I mean, the influence of the Russian propaganda and disinformation campaigns before the war, they were like pretty much the same in, in Ukraine and Georgia. So we do have all this you know, phenomena of uh, Ukraine as a failed state, you know, that was somehow lobbied, advocated by, by Russia propaganda. And actually, starting from, from 2014, Ukraine um, finally realized that we have to do something with the, that huge, massive, huge arrays of uh, propaganda and disinformation campaigns coming to Ukraine. And that's why the first steps were taken back to 2016 and 17, I suppose. So then these um, Russia-backed social media platforms were banned. I mean, Odnoklasniki and Kontakte. Uh, later on, Russian-backed TV channels also were, uh, were banned in Ukraine. So gradually, we somehow tried to decrease the level of propaganda. I mean, those, they were so visible within the country, you know, and we actually like did a lot of good job on that. We also do have, and we had before like good monitoring campaigns. We have pretty good and professional media environment, journalist environment who did track, who did fact checking, who somehow were trying, you know, to promote the critical thinking and also to educate people on how to see the propaganda, how to differentiate between different layers of propaganda truth versus lie you know half truths also this very like general ones or very specific ones and we also have established this governmental center to tackle the propaganda and um so we have some lessons learned and we actually did achieve some success before the war and now so I wouldn't say that we are lucky because I'm not sure whether I can, you know, use this word, but we were more prepared to this disinformation attacks to that so much of propaganda um, on the national level and also on the international because it wasn't something new to us, you know, uh, in comparison to to other EU countries or other countries worldwide. Um, now, I think if we also like compare the level of propaganda within Ukraine, I should admit that the level of critical thinking of the population is now a bit higher because it's not a peaceful life anymore. You know, we are living under martial law and it means that you have to have the access to truthful information. 
to the sources that you can trust. And nowadays it is like the general Zaluzhny, the armed forces of Ukraine, of course, the president, the government, the main uh, spokespersons on behalf of the country, on behalf of the state. Um, so now, you know, like people are trying to get the information and to verify the source, which is of course good for us. And also we have a lot of information campaigns, awareness raising campaigns run by civil society organizations, journalistic, uh, some kind of groups, communities to tackle this information that is still in place. But first, um, I mean, they're doing this in kind of creative waves, um, also trying to, um, to tackle those really very pervert um, disinformation campaigning laid by um, by Russians. Um, I mean, in terms of the disinformation, it's not that seen uh, nowadays. I mean, Russia is, of, of course, they are spending a huge budget and they're paying a lot of money to invest into disinformation campaigns in other countries. Because in Ukraine, you know, like we still have our own track, and I mean that we already know how to tackle it more. And the biggest challenge for us right now is to be proactive outside Ukraine, because we cannot tackle those propagandas, you know, in other countries. Um, the first case we were speaking uh, before this um, before the session with you, Maya, you were uh, telling about the healthcare that Ukrainians have access to the Polish healthcare uh, system, and I think one of those like disinformation campaigns that I came across during the first uh, days of war is um, what that Ukrainians have had an unlimited access, or they had some privileges while uh, you know while uh, addressing uh, the doctor or having access to the uh, to the healthcare and then the minister of healthcare of Poland he just he was very straightforward saying that no this is russian propaganda so please do not believe this and after that everybody you know, has uh, as bad access to polish healthcare and the, the, it's equal amongst everyone <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah and there were so many cases you know in, in other countries like i mean we have some refugee who uh who broke somebody's marriage in the uk and again so it was you know it was so i mean come on it is so seen you know it is so visible that it is like, it just cannot be true and this this information is falsified um but there were also, you know, some biggest challenges that we had to face at the very beginning. For instance, we were struggling for, for many days to, uh, to name the war a war, actually. You know, you can also, like, recall that we have a conflict, uh, a Ukrainian conflict. Even now, you know, like, when we're coming across BBC or CNN news, you still can see those, like, war in ukraine narrative but come on you know like everyone knows that now you know like russia invaded ukraine and we cannot just okay territory wise yes the war is in ukraine but this is of course not ukrainians uh, fighting among each other but we have this external um, external invasion uh, in place so now i would say that for us you know it's more even more interesting to observe how these disinformation campaigns tackle countries outside Ukraine. You know, because again, we know what to do inside the country. Of course, under this martial law, the tools that we can use as civil society or the government, they are limited. But still, you know, like we're we were living with this for, for many years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ina. That's such an interesting perspective. Also, in terms of uh, right now, as we're all figuring out exactly what can be done, right? How can we counter what are the effective ways of uh, countering uh, disinformation, uh, given how diverse and varied it is and what sort of on how many levels it works? Um, I'm looking at time. And so maybe I'll just go, I'll combine <laughs> questions, uh, two questions that we have. Um, 
to, and I'll ask you to be brief, uh, one that is about, so what's next? Meaning what can we expect in the upcoming months? Uh, given as the uh, the war continues, the obviously the refugees are um, uh, are in other countries. There are also very uh, many internally displaced uh, uh, Ukrainians. This the world situ economic situation is definitely not going to get better anytime uh, soon. So, what can we expect in the upcoming months? And uh, if you could combine it with. So what can we do about it? We mostly meaning civil society organizations um, as uh, uh, in order to counter it or to sort of uh, add our uh, um, uh, efforts in order to somehow mitigate the, the negative effects and whoever wants to go first. If I may, I will take the lead and uh, tell you more about, well, what I expect that's going to happen in the next few months. And I, I believe that uh, the propaganda and disinformation will continue to influx our minds and lives and uh, as well as other nations, uh, but the themes will be changing and I don't think it will be disinformation regarding Ukraine or Mr. Zelensky, but it will be more connected to the increasing crisis and I expect that the trend in the long term would be to make uh, civilians uh, the, the citizens in particular states, especially in the in, in Western countries, to be uh, more angry about their government and don't uh, uh, and, and well initiate like a lack of support for for the continuous policy of support of Ukraine. So in my opinion, that would be the, the long term goal of uh, Russia and uh, its allies who are fighting the war in Ukraine. And uh, what to do? Well, I strongly recommend that it's the state that is the most important partner in defending uh, the nation against the influence of propaganda and disinformation. So therefore, every nation should do far more in building their capacities for strategic communication and also improve their relation with uh, their own citizens and turn them into partners who can be capable of defending the information space as well. But that needs to be like a collaboration of uh, I would say powers that are represented in every state in Europe and in the world, consisting of uh, civil society, consisting of private sector and consisting of the state. So they need to work hand in hand in overcoming this crisis. So Tomas is un uh, highlighting the sort of move more towards fueling the internal uh, conflicts and crises. Uh, and which then again will turn people against their governments who are uh, uh, and turn their attention away from Ukraine. And, and just one quick note, uh, uh, there was this very good note that uh, a lot of this information are taking place now on different platforms like Telegram, but we really should also focus on the old big platforms like Facebook, for instance, because in Slovakia only, there's still more than 1,800 800 pages that are promoting Russian propaganda or pro-Russian narratives that are demoralizing uh, people here, affecting millions. And uh, we really need to continue pushing on digital platforms to improve, uh, well, their capability of moderation of the content and be more responsible because this crisis uh, is of really uh, serious nature and uh, they also have to be part of the solution and can no longer provide us with those, uh, well, excuses for not taking action. Yeah, excuses is a is a delicate word for it. Um, uh, Jana, do you? Because you mentioned you commented that uh, that you the uh, Russian media outlets are still very much uh, uh, present in Georgia. What do you expect to see in the upcoming months? Um, as I was saying uh, with you that uh, there is a turbulent situation in Georgia uh, because of the EU situation that we did not get these candidacy. So people are really protesting against the government as a, and, and we have a big protest uh, on, on Sunday. So uh, everything will be very much dependent on what will happen on Sunday. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are demanding resignation of the government and um, replacing them by uh, the interim government uh, just to fulfill the recommendations um, you has uh, uh, suggested us. So uh, I very much agree with Tomas when it comes to the Western countries and European countries. Um, as for Georgia, um, 
I'm sure the volume of the disinformation will just increase. Um, and uh, we are in an unlucky situation because um, Thomas has also mentioned that um, the government plays a crucial role in tackling disinformation, and that's not the case in Georgia. Not sometimes, but usually and mostly government is a source of disinformation. So in that case, I mean, we um, civil society are doing our best to attack on disinformation on, on Facebook, on Twitter, everywhere, basically. And uh, for example, my organization is even creating some tools, software tools to you know, tackle disinformation and use uh, not only old fashioned, but some innovative ways to um, you know, be more efficient. But we cannot do much without government support. And in our case, um, the government is not standing uh, with us and by our side. GPN, some more good news uh, from <laughs> Romania. I, I think that on, on short term, we can expect uh, seeing more praises for Russia, Russian advances, Russian behavior, sort of a whitewashing of Russia through cultural products, uh, things like that, while attacking Ukrainians or Ukrainian refugee, like look what those particular two refugees did in Poland or Romania or wherever. So this is expected to come. Um, on a longer term, I think that uh, we can expect the culture wars to become a greater issue since we've seen what happened in the US and it's going to come and hit Europe uh, with a vengeance, I think. Um, I also agree with Tomasz, of course, that um, you know all of this will be coupled with the pro economic problems and um, you know, trying to paint Russians as not so bad and Ukrainians as not so good will come with this thing like let's let's mind our own business and let's not uh, pay attention to the war because we have inflation and, and so on. Um, what to do? Obviously, I agree that we need to work with the government. Unfortunately, in Romania. Uh, we are scared of letting the government interfere because there's this risk of then the government using, you know, these powers to combat this information, to fight with media organizations that are not uh, okay with what the government is doing. So there's a very um, kind of a barrier between civil uh, uh, society and the government in that in this sense and it's been growing in the last year and I expect it to grow further uh, but I would say that as um, civil society organizations we should try to kind of push this discussion on media literacy and disinformation to normalize it in a way because We've seen during COVID, there was a, a very, uh, uh, you know, a large increase in interest for, for such topics. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was looking for workshops, for courses and things like that. And now it's decreasing because, you know, there's the pandemic is over, let's say, and people are started to do their own things. But I think we have to find ways to go from, you know, there's that expression, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, and I think we have to think about that. Um, uh, Anna, actually, uh, who, who's in our team, uh, she, she has a version of this expression that is, it's not a marathon, uh, it's not a sprint, it's not a marathon, it's a relay race in a sense that you have to sort of, well, everybody will get so tired at some point that you have True. to sort of, we have to support each other and sort of pass the baton or whatever this thing is called in, in relays, uh, because it cannot be like, not everybody can keep their focus and their energy and their strength uh, throughout. So so it takes a, a whole ecosystem to, um, uh, to, to carry on. But maybe in that sense, uh, Irina, I know that obviously Ukrainian organizations are uh, have sort of more important things on their minds right now, but learning from Ukraine's uh, experiences and in strengthening that general level of critical thinking and that uh, resilience to disinformation, is there something that that sort of neighboring countries or countries in the CE can 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 learn from that and can apply? I mean, 
it again it depends everything on the level of the civil society and how much um how much how strong they are i mean because it's all about you know educating people over and over again but so we I, I would put it frankly that we didn't see that much progress for the last, you know, starting from 2014 until until the start of the war. So actually, with the collapse of the war, people finally realized that now they have to find some trustful sources, and that's that's the official data because they are afraid of their their own lives. But in terms of you know some expectations on, or um, some. You know some patterns that we can see right now i mean um this is like ukraine is not unique and we also had a very similar situation in terms of the refugees in 2014 when actually the war started there on donbass and the first wave of migrants the first wave of refugees from donbass to to poland um actually also kicked out then and after a half a year or it was like nine months after the collapse of the of the war, when the um, the countries, you know, the hosting countries, again with the support of Russian propaganda, they became a bit tired of the refugees. Why should we support them? And, and so on and so forth. So of course there was a huge, huge influence of this information campaign, uh, targeting on this cultural hatred, you know, and cause finding some really like simple cause on how to fight Ukrainians and in other nations. Uh, basically, this is something that gonna happen again. And, you know, there is, uh, of, co of course, it will happen at some point. For now, when we are uh, monitoring the news and we know the war is still there, there is a lot of uh, civilian casualties, not only military guys or um suffered and in these terms of course the support of the world it's still in place but this is something that will again decrease and it already decreased you know so again it's not only about the disinformation but it's also about showing the real state of play what is going on in ukraine so please you know like do not we we need to, to to find some balance in tackling the disinformation from the russian side and also showing the real cases that we still have in ukraine so let's do not forget about keeping the balance because sometimes you know we can play around so much around okay we are fighting disinformation or propaganda let's do this stuff but truth this is what really matters and let's focus you know on showing the truth on promoting the the truth so promoting uh sort of trustful um reliant uh, news uh news sources sources of information that um that we can uh we can be uh we can trust and that we can be um sure of is uh that's i think a really interesting point that it's not just about countering or on the other hand building positive narratives which ukraine has also been amazing at um but sort of at the very basic level it's about uh promoting uh good uh information and uh trustful trustful sources which is again not an easy uh easy task in this information um landscape when we're, we're getting our, our our facts from so facts or not necessarily facts from so many different um uh, sources um we have a question which is quite a big one uh but we have a couple of minutes uh how much does the uh, alice asked how much does democracy suffer in the context of fake news and disinformation and i know this is huge um uh but maybe uh somebody would like to take it if I may, I would just add that democracy dies when people are unable to make informed decisions and when they are uh, motivated to make decisions based on lies and fears that opens up the door for tyranny. So uh, we need a healthy information space where people can make informed decisions. Otherwise, uh, freedom of speech doesn't really exist in, in, in such a landscape where uh, lies are prevalent. So uh if we want to have democracy uh we have to have truth we have to know truth we have to live in truth
Yeah, that sounds like a good s summary of this very huge question. Um, I, I wanted to point out, there's a thing that I like from this, um, is he Ukrainian, Peter Pomerantsev? I think he's Ukrainian, but he lives in uh, the UK, I think, right? So he, he's talking about this replacement of political ideology with conspiracy theories. And I think that's a very huge issue that we don't even realize now. We can see it already coming in the United States, and I'm sorry to bring it up again, but they kind of set the trend in the information space. So we see a lot of politicians in Congress that are talking about um, space lasers that are causing fires and, you know, QAnon stuff. And that is, that is incredible. And the fact that they get in Congress means that we, unfortunately, are in a bit of more danger than we think. Anyone Not else? very optimistic, I know. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out how we can end. Not that the 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 outlook on anything is optimistic right now. Anything happening in the world, but uh, how we could end with something, uh, something maybe. Um, not positive but constructive uh let's say if i may um i really think that the best thing we can do is invest in our communities and in ourselves like like we really need to think about how to be uh, mentally able to overcome the crisis and then invest into our mental health so we would be resilient on a on a mental level against all the threats that we will be facing. And as you were mentioning, Peter Pomeranz, so I actually have his book right here uh, and I've been meeting him uh, lately. And for me, the people like him are a great inspiration that it's the professionals, it's the thinkers, philosophers who are fueling, uh, well, the understanding of the whole phenomena. And I would say that even though we are facing it for now eight years, uh, we are do, doing and getting better at understanding and overcoming it. So I, I see a lot of progress here. And I think that once maybe in 10, 15, 20 years, when all of this will be over and we'll be living in a very different future from now, I think we will have a lot of experiences that will make us live in more safer uh, world where infor information space, for instance, would be um, based on different principles, Would uh, people would have uh, different policies uh, in how to actually make it safer. And also we would be better at understanding humans, our psychology and all the elements that actually make can make our lives better. So I still think that th this all has a silver lining. Like once the war is over, once all these crises are over, we will be definitely uh, capable of uh, creating a better future for all of us. That is positive. Uh, so maybe for uh, uh, for the last words, I'll hand it off to Irina uh, with the question of because obviously we are all here uh, to in our way support Ukraine and support everything you're doing. Um, maybe maybe you have some tips for us on how can we do it, whether it's supporting uh, Opora or following uh, exactly news channels that are um, that are reliable or uh, on an individual level, whatever you think is, is, is appropriate. Yeah, as I told before, like Ukrainian civil society, we cannot be that proactive in uh, other countries because we still have a lot of stuff to do <laughs> in our own country. But still, I think that the good exchange of information or tracking this disinformation campaigns all over the world, that must be you know, a, a huge advantage of the civil society worldwide. I mean, there were some cases you know, when we can actually track how one disinformation campaign or how one fake news actually goes from one country to another. So perhaps, I mean, you know, like this is something that the, at the governmental level, it's very difficult to, to do, but we who are very used to networking, who are very used, you know, to, to cooperation in, in different regions, we can do that. And I mean, um, you know, it's very easy to show very clear cases 
to to people and to we, in ukraine we say to to show your hand you know or to explain using your fingers or, which is one from one to five and say okay please have a look how you are getting manipulated so perhaps what we can do, you know, is just to combine our efforts to unite uh, some activities to think on how we within the EU or, or beyond the EU can track these disinformation campaigns, how we can level, how we can evaluate the influence of this propaganda and come up with some really um, easygoing, very user-friendly tools or some methodologies on how to tackle the disinformation not on our you know i wouldn't say experts but i mean of course all of us this is kind of our expertise you know but trying to find some new ways on how we can pass this knowledge and tools to to the grassroots that is that is a big task, but something we can definitely focus on and should develop further in the future. Um, we are out of time, and I would like to thank you so, so much, Irina, Jana, Tomasz, Cibran. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise. Um, to everyone who, uh, who logged in uh, despite the heat and the time, uh, thank you so much for following us. We will be sharing the recording with you uh, through an email as well as through our social media channels. So please follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube uh, as well, where this recording will be up. Um, and we will share links to, um, to uh, valuable researches as well as contacts to, to our amazing uh, speakers. Uh, so thank you so, so much. And uh, we I hope we will do continue this conversation in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks to thank everyone. You. Bye. -bye. Bye.